ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಿ ತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾವಿತ್ ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಗುರುರ್ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಗುರುರ್ವಿಷ್ಣು ಗುರುರ್ದೇವೋ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರ ಗುರುರೇವ ಪರಂ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಸಮಸ್ತ ಜನ ಕಲ್ಯಾಣೆ ನಿರತ ಕರುಣಾಮಯ ನಮಿ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ದೇವ ಸದ್ಗುರು ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ವಿತ್ವರ ಸದ್ಗುರು ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ವಿತ್ವರ ವಕ್ತುಂ ಸುಬೋಧ ವೇದಾಂತ ಪ್ರವೃತ್ತೋ ಹ್ಯ ಬುಧೋಪ್ಯಹಂ ಕೃಪೆಯ ಯಂ ವಂದೇ ಶ್ರೀ ಗಣೇಶಂ ಪುನಃ ಪುನಃ ವಂದೇ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವಿ ಸದ್ಗುರು ಮೇ ಮಹಾಮತಿ ಸೀತಾ ಸೇತ ಶ್ರೀರಾಮ ಯಂತು ಶುಭದಾಮತಿ ಆತ್ಮಕ್ರೀಡಸ್ವಾತ್ಮರತಿ ಜೀವನ್ಮುಕ್ತ ಸದಾ ಸುಖಿ ಆತ್ಮಕ್ರೀಡಸ್ವಾತ್ಮರತಿ ಜೀವನ್ಮುಕ್ತ ಸದಾ ಸುಖಿ ಪುಣ್ಯ ಪುಣ್ಯವಿನಿರ್ಮುಕ್ತ ಸರ್ವಾನಂದಕರೋಯತಿ ಪುಣ್ಯ ಪುಣ್ಯವಿನಿರ್ಮುಕ್ತ ಸರ್ವಾನಂದಕರೋಯತಿ ದ ಲಿಬರೇಟೆಡ್ ಒನ್ ಸ್ಪೋರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ರೆವಲ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಎವರ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಹಿ ಈಸ್ ಫ್ರೀ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಮೆರಿಟ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಿ ಬಿಕಮ್ಸ್ ದ ಗಿವರ್ ಆಫ್ ಜಾಯ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ನೈವ ಕುರ್ವನ್ನ ಕಾರಯನ್ ಕಾರ್ಯ ಸಾಧ್ನೋತಿ ನೈವ ಕುರ್ವನ್ನ ಕಾರಯನ್ ಕಾರ್ಯ ಸಾಧ್ನೋತಿ ಆಶ್ಚರ್ಯ ನಿ ಕಿಮೇ ತತ್ ಪಶ್ಯುಧವೈಭವ ಆಶ್ಚರ್ಯ ನಿ ಕಿಮೇ ತತ್ ಪಶ್ಯುಧವೈಭವ ನೈದ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ನಾರ್ ಕಾಸಿಂಗ್ ಅದರ್ಸ್ ಟು ಡೂ ಹಿ ಆಲ್ವೇಸ್ ಅಕಾಂಪ್ಲಿಷಸ್ ಟಾಸ್ಕ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಅ ವಂಡರ್ ಸಿ ದ ಗ್ಲೋರಿ ಆಫ್ ದ ಎನ್ಲೈಟೆಂಡ್ ಒನ್ ಹರಿಂ 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 ಸೊ ಹಾ ಯು ಸೋ ದ ಸಮರಿ ಆಫ್ ದ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ವೀಕ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಲುಕ್ಡ್ ಎಟ್ ಅ ಫ್ಯೂ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ವಿವ್ ಗೋನ್ ಥ್ರೂ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದಟ್ ಆಲ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ಆನ್ ವಿತ್ ದ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಎಸ್ ಐ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ಆನ್ ವಿತ್ ದ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ಇಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ಆನ್ಸರ್ ದ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ಹಾ ದಟ್ ನೀಡ್ ಅ ಬಿಟ್ ಮೋರ್ ಕ್ಲಾರಿಫಿಕೇಶನ್ so the last word that we saw punya apunya nirmukta one who is free of punya and apunya and that we just explained the next word sarva ananda karoyati hi so these are all the characteristics of being enlightened yeah so of an enlightened person and also when we gain that enlightenment this is what it will be like sarva anandakara yatihi so yatihi means uh, person of great simplicity yati means sanyasi but person of great simplicity not connected to anything yeah anandakara anandakara means one who creates or gives happiness yeah sarva to all so one who gives happiness to all now i said that when we look at these verses there's two ways to look at the one is from the standpoint of a seeker and this is my goal and the other standpoint is that of looking at the nature of a realized master and what they do yeah we said we will look at it from the standpoint of our goal as a seeker what is my goal my goal is this yeah 
Now, Sarvananda Karoyati, if you look at it, Sarvananda Karo, one who gives happiness to all, if you think of it from the standpoint of being a seeker, this almost sounds quite overwhelming. You know, there's too much to do. How to keep everyone happy? Yeah. <laughs> It almost sounds like how to keep, that you must keep everyone happy. And I think if you spend some time living with people, you'll realize that it's a very difficult project. This project is almost impossible. You just need to live with one person for a period of time. And then you realize that's it. This Anandakara is a difficult business, very difficult business. Now, what do we mean by the state of enlightenment is one where it brings happiness to all? See, in all human interactions, in all human interactions, we all want happiness from each other. Yeah. If we are in any relationship, the reason we are in that relationship is because we want happiness from that person. Otherwise, we won't be in a relationship. Yeah? We want something from that person. Otherwise, why are you in that relationship? Now, what happens is we have a belief that if I get this particular thing from this particular person, then they are keeping me happy. Then I'm happy. Yeah. If I get respect from this particular person, I'm happy. If I get affection from this group of people, I'm happy. If I get gifts from these people, I'm happy. If these people serve me, then I'll be happy. So our concept of happiness, getting happiness from people, is connected to doing and receiving. Yeah? People must give me something. Yeah? And there some object should be there. Yeah? When an object is given to me, directed towards me, and for me, and that too many times exclusively, then you say, now that person is keeping me happy. Yeah. That exclusive factor becomes important as well. Huh? That it should just be for me. Then I feel special. Special. Huh? See, if someone goes, or your friend goes overseas and they go to Europe and they come back and they buy a oh, little trinket for you, they give to you. Then after that, another friend walks into your house. They give them the same trinket because they have a box of them for you. And another person comes for you. Now what's happening? Your feeling of being special is drum. But actually what happened is they gave you a gift. Because they gave you a gift, why aren't you happy? Yeah. But no, that gift should be for me. It shouldn't just be for me. For me is correct. For me and me alone. This alone is a problem. For me and me alone, this exclusivity is a problem. So what happens is we start connecting what we want from people as some sort of object, gift, service, respect, or affection. And we believe that if we get these things, that person is making me happy. Happy through the gift, happy through... Huh? the service, happy through, respect and affection. However, if you really fundamentally get down, if you really fundamentally get down to what actually makes people happy in a relationship is that we want to be surrounded by people that are happy. This is the most important. If I'm surrounded by people that are happy, my mood all of a sudden just changes. And you know, if the people around me are happy, you don't even need to do anything for me. Because they're happy. So if they're happy, then what? I'm not listening to complaints. I'm not listening to whinging. I'm not listening to problems. I'm not having to fix this. There are no demands put on me to become someone or to do something. You know what? You'll thoroughly enjoy that relationship. But because in our relationships, there's always a, you need to become this. You need to do this. So because we place demands on relationships, then to, what do you call, offset the demands, we have to do gifts. Hmm? So I need you to become this person. Huh? And happy birthday, here's a tie. 
you know so then there's an offsetting of like here's your tie but then you must also become this person so there is demand in the relationship and because there is demand in the relationship you then give gift the essence of how to keep a person happy is if if they are surrounded by people that are happy and don't have any demands upon them then actually you'll be very happy you will really cherish that relationship in a very deep way yeah they are joyous to be around and no demand whatsoever and we've all experienced this sometimes we've just gone to some social occasion party we met someone new at someone's house and the person we met was just so happy and so lively you know very joyous person and they didn't ask anything from you they were not the host huh they were not your guest they were just another person in that room with you and both of you are just you know having a good time and we really remember that person and why do we remember and enjoy that person so much is because they gave joy but they had no demand and this is the key this is the key to keeping people happy this is the key if i can be a person who can give joy or just be joyous be joyous and not place any demand this is the essence of sarvananda karaha this is how the master operates the master is not going around trying to figure out how to fix everyone's problems in life because this would be a very exhausting life a tiring life and then some people don't want their problems fixed you know that's also the because some of us are defined by our problems then if you take that problem away from me i i don't know who i am i'm a zero therefore don't take that problem away from me so when i say my life is tough don't sit there and give a big sermon about how life is a game and enjoy it no don't do that huh don't do that you make me very upset yeah so what is the best thing the best thing is that uh -huh. if we want to the highest level of making people happy we should be happy that's the main thing we should be happy yeah and then we should have no demands upon others this is the nature of realization in realization i am spontaneously happy it is not a happiness because you have done something for me is a happiness because i myself am reveling in my own true blissful nature yeah and so this is the key sarvananda kara so it doesn't mean the, the, the enlightenment is not a stage of going around and pleasing people it is not going around and trying to keep everyone happy that's not the state of enlightenment it is spontaneous happiness with no demand upon the other person this is how huh people become happy and in this context a very interesting point to make and i think you also may have come up in the discussion when we say what do we expect or what do we think an enlightened person would be like then i think one of the words was compassionate the compassion is a very interesting word i looked it up mm -hmm. so compassion is defined as an extreme sensitivity to the sufferings of others plus a commitment to alleviate them mm -hmm. so extreme sensitivity to sufferings of others but commitment to alleviate them is called compassion that's very funny i was reading all the shastras of this nature this jivan mukta and even if you see here three verses we have got the word compassion does not come jivan mukta compassion doesn't come you look all this anandam paramanandam is reveling in bliss atmakridha sporting in oneself atmaratihi reveling in oneself 
Punya Punya Vinir Muktaha, free of all Punya Papa. Sarvananda Karo Yati, I say he is spontaneously given joy and having no demands on others. Na Eva Kurvan, he is not actively engaged in things. Na Karyan, not making other people do things. Yet Sadnoti Sarvada Karyam, things get done. Yeah. In Sanskrit word karuna is compassion, daya, compassion, yeah, krupa, compassion. But in all, I was reading many different shastras on the nature of enlightened person. This word does not come. It does not say that they are compassionate, not the nature of Jivan Mukta. Uh -huh. It said teacher is compassionate. Teacher, guru is compassionate, but an enlightened person is not necessarily compassionate. Then why is this? Because we said compassion, extreme sensitivity to the pain of others. That should be there. Commitment to alleviate others' pain, that commitment is optional. For Jivan Mukta, a Jivan Mukta cannot be bound by any rules and regulations. Why? Because rules and regulations are for the ego and for the ego to evolve to attain moksha. Now the person has attained moksha. When the person has attained moksha, why are they following rules? That's why punya punya don't count for that person. The rules are to make sure punya and punya are taken care of. It's beyond punya and punya. Yeah. So, when a person attains enlightenment, there is no rule that binds them. Like in a game, if you're playing the game, you have to follow the rules. Once you leave the game, you don't need to follow the rules anymore. Huh? Say I am playing soccer or football, and one man is a referee, and he blows his whistle. And every time he blows his whistle, the game has to stop, huh? and he had to listen to him. Now, this friend of mine who's the referee when we play, we go meet outside. And when we meet outside, he blows his whistle. Now, when he blows his whistle outside the game, do I just stop and listen to him? I don't need to stop and listen to him. We're not playing the game anymore. I only stop and listen to him when we are in the game. Because in the game, he is the umpire. He is giving rules. And anyone playing in that game must listen to him. So when he blows the whistle, everyone must stop. Everyone must listen. Now, game is over. We are going back to his house, eating some chips, watching TV, and he blows his whistle. Now, when he blows his whistle, I don't need to stop and listen to him that 20 times. Uh, he's not referee anymore. Why? I am not in the game. I am outside the game. Hmm? Now, same way, Jivan Mukta has finished the game. Game is over. He has finished the game of samsara. It's over, actually. So what does that mean? No rules pertain to him. No rules, regulations pertain to that person. Therefore, does that person have to go around solving everyone's problem, committed to alleviating everyone's pain, does not have to. Does not have to. It is completely optional if they do. It's optional. It's optional. If they do it, it is then called compassion. If they take up a path where they alleviate other people's pain, then it is called compassion. But there's also no need to do that. Now, this can be a little bit surprising because our concept of enlightened person, compassion, 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 helping everyone. You know, the reason why many times our concept of enlightened people is going around helping everyone is because actually the only people we know, uh, the only enlightened souls that we know are people who serve society. They served us. But if you go to Himalayas, there are many Mahatmas just sitting there only. 
they are very happy. They are living in bliss, but they are not coming down to go actively start missions and organizations. They had never, we will sit there only and live there. Many Mahatmas are there, but more Mahatmas are doing that than coming down to help the people. And if you read the Shastra, the Shastra indicates do that. The Shastra indicates uh, for that Jeevan Mukta, Mahim Charan, he just walks the earth. Yadrichaya Laba Santushtaha, happy whatever comes. It does not say that he goes around actively helping people. Mm -hmm. so what is the point behind all this? What am I saying all this? Yeah, Because you have to understand the concept of helping others. The greatest way you can help others is that you are radiating bliss. You are radiating bliss and you have no demands on others. This is the key. Have no demands and just be joyous. This is the greatest thing you can give. Often when I used to think about my grandmother, my grandmother was like this, very simple lady. She just sat in the house. She never asked me to do anything. She never put any, she didn't say, she never asked me, how are your studies? Are you working hard? Why are you watching TV? She never asked any of these things. You're playing with your Lego too much. Stop that. Get back to your mathematics. Nothing. She just sat there, smiled the whole time. And then every now and then, eat some food. Come, I'll make you some food. That was it. <laughs> No demands, and she never even forced that food. Some grandmothers are force feeding the children the food, the different children, ah, nothing like that. No force feeding either. If you want to eat, eat, you don't want to eat, not eat. Yeah, but she was a very happy and very pleasant person. And you know, having such a person in the house, you know, some sort of peace was there. There was some peace because this personality was just there. And when she wasn't there, it just felt a little bit empty, a little bit of emptiness. That space was a bit empty. Yeah. And so I often remember that's an interesting experience to have. Now, even in lights of in the life of great Mahatma, you see, there are some that live like this. Ramana Maharishi. If you see Ramana Maharishi, he was just exhibiting peace and bliss, but he did not do anything. He sat on Arunachaleshwar, huh? Arunachala, the hill. He just sat there. And then they built an ashram around him. In fact, after he got realization, he was in samadhi and monam for many months. He wouldn't talk to anyone. He was in samadhi for two months sitting in the bottom of the temple. No one knew he was there. Then they found him. They pulled him out. They tended and bandaged him up. Some great people were there. They realized some great bhaktas were there. They, 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 this is a special, he was 16 years old, 16 year old boy. They realized this something is special about him. He's got some greatness to him. They were feeling so much peace in his presence just by looking at him, being in his presence. They were feeling and experiencing the ananda. So they tended to him, looked after him. They had to feed him. He would not feed himself. They had to feed him, put food into his mouth. He would not eat. Then for a long period of time, like two years, moan him. He never spoke to anyone. They still looked after him. Yeah. Then after a long period of time, he, he then spoke some words. And he never went out and then did lots of preaching and teaching and he didn't go out and start organizations. Or anything. He just sat there. They then built the ashram around him. And those who have been to that ashram, Ramana Ashram, you will know the main thing in that ashram. There's not, there's not like discourses going on. There's not all these things happening. It's that they have his kutir there. His kutir in his room, where he used to sit the main satsang hall. There's a big picture of him, a very famous picture of him just lying down, you know, his arm like this. And anyone, you know, I have been there. This is now 50 years after his Mahasamadhi. 1950, he's around there, his Mahasamadhi. Even if you sit in that room, you'll experience that peace. But his presence was so powerful. He was just, and his whole thing was silence. There's no need to talk. Silence. In that silence, people were enjoying, and today people still enjoy that peace. 
I just spoke to a lady the other day. She said she went there. She doesn't, she's not a bhakta of Ramana Maharishi or anything. She said she just experienced that. She experienced that. Now, this actually is the nature of a realized person. Just their existence is giving peace and happiness. Their presence. They don't have to actively do something. So one level is presence. That's the only thing that really is happening. Now, if the realized master then engages in any form of work, such as teaching, if they choose to help others, this is compassion. Because now they come commitment to alleviate the pain of others. So in the Lakshana characteristics of a guru, you will see compassion is there. Ahe tukadaya sindhu, Vivekchudamani. Harama karunike na acharye na dayalu na Shankaracharya. Why? Because now become a teacher. A teacher is a job. A teacher involves a commitment to relieve the pain of others. So in teaching, all of a sudden, that person has now engaged in a compassionate activity to alleviate pain of others. That's how I'm teaching, how counseling. Yeah, counseling, people come to Mahatmas, gain advice, words of advice, some satsang, that long. Yeah. And then, of course, what our Gurudev did was start a whole mission and serve society at every level. He served society from the most advanced seekers by setting up Sandi Panisadhana Alaya. Yeah. Then four Grahastas went to Karma Yoga. He had a field in which they could do Karma Yoga by setting up the whole mission, starting study classes, teaching children, teaching youth. He trained everyone up. He gave them administrative skills. He set the disciplines for the organization, created a structure that would last years after his Mahasana. Massive project. Then he went down even further and he said, those that don't have basic necessities, don't have jobs, don't have money, don't have income, don't have water, don't have electricity, will do work for them. Chimay Organization of Rural Development, court, and hospitals, orphanages, all this. All this was optional. There was no need to do any of this work. In fact, his teacher said, don't go down. The Pohanji Maharaj said, you stay in the Himalayas, sit quietly. Whoever comes to you, you teach and then let them go. He said, nothing doing. I am going down like mighty Ganga. <laughs> I will go down. It's so important to understand this point because then only we can appreciate that all of us have benefited from the compassion of a teacher. It, the, all of this was optional. There was no compulsion to do any of this. No obligation to do any of this. Nowhere in the Shastra is even written they should do this. The Shastra does say he lives as he lives. No commitment to go around help, help the entire world and uplift all of humanity. Nothing. So if a Mahatma has done that, that is a sign of extreme compassion. That's why Guruji has written those shlokas. Samasta jana kalyane niratam karunamayam. Prostrations to that Gurudev Swami Chimayananda, who Niratam continually engaged in what? Samasta Jana Kalyane, welfare and happiness of all people. And how could he do that? Karunamayam, because absolute embodiment of pure compassion. Compassion. So this compassion, this is not even a lakshana of Jeevan Mukta. Jeevan Mukta does not have to be compassionate. When we find a Jeevan Mukta who is doing work for society, that is great compassion. That is great compassion. 
That's how our gratitude is called Kritagnata, but become deeper because we should recognize this. See, it's the difference between a parent feeding a child, right? And then a random stranger then also feeding that child. Parent feeds a child obligation, you're supposed to do your duty only. It's negligence if you don't. A stranger doesn't have to look after your child and feed them. But if a stranger comes and looks after your child and feeds it, or you go walking off somewhere else and forgot the child or something, huh? and that stranger decides to protect the child, look after the child, care for the child, huh? then that is, an, that is an optional thing. That is not out of compassion. But parent looking after a child, that is not an act of compassion. That duty is being fulfilled. We should not think that the realized master has a duty to serve us. There is no duty. That's why if any way in our life we have been blessed or been in contact with a realized master, understand that is compassion. And the fact that Gurudev came from India all the way here, he didn't even ask us to go to India. <laughs> that itself is tremendous compassion. Huh? So this compassion is a very interesting thing to understand because we must understand it connected to Sarvananda Karaha. How is he bringing happiness? So many different ways happiness can be brought. But the essence of giving happiness to a person is that you don't have an obligation to keep people happy. You have an obligation, actually. Your commitment should be, you become happiness and have no demand on them. This is how to live our life. Otherwise, we are trying to figure out ways how to make this person happy, how to make that person happy, how to make this person happy. And it's a failing project. It's always a failing project. Because the minute you make them happy one year by doing the best anniversary birthday party they've ever seen, the biggest problem you have after that is next year you have to top it. Now, how do you top it next year? Well, right now, I, I, whoo, I've got no ideas. So next year, we'll have a quiet one no? and just sit in. And you try to negotiate, no presence, no, no presence. Now, when it's no presence, no presence still means standard flowers must be given, chocolates must be given, card must be given. No presence doesn't mean no presence. Huh? I, I think. All husbands would have figured this thing out by now, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> you see, you must understand, yeah, that if we are actively trying to go out there and figure how to make everyone happy, it is a thoroughly exhausting project and it's a project that will fail because people change in what they want. What they wanted 10 years ago and what they want now changed. What they wanted last year, what they want now changed. What they want last month and today changed. What people wanted for dinner yesterday and dinner today changed. Whatever you cooked them yesterday and made them happy, you cook the same thing today and see what happens. Oh, oh, same. Maybe yesterday you enjoyed it so much. Yeah, but that was, yeah, I was in the mood for it. Mood. Now we already ate. Why are you eating the same thing again? You see, it's impossible to keep people happy. So what it means by this brings happiness to others, brings happiness to others by being spontaneously happy, by reveling in their self, radiating that bliss and peace. And the main thing is have no demands on them. Hmm? Have no demands. In this way, this is the nature of Jeevan Mukta. Now you understand it from me as a seeker, we have to understand that goal. The goal is not to correct and change the entire world. The goal is always, I have to become a better version of myself. Others, if they don't want to be a better version of themselves, they also have that freedom not to be. Now, I know some people in their house, spouse are not interested in spirituality. So these people try to grab the spouse and then push them on to listen to this talk. And then you can't get them to the ashram. Now bring Swamiji into your house. And then they turn this microphone up very loud so the volume is blaring that they can't do anything in their house because my voice is booming around in the background of your poor spouse can't watch TV, can't do anything, can't move anywhere. 
because you have now connected the computer to all the surround sound system and satsang is going on. Somewhere you're trying to force it into them. So you see, all this, <laughs> all this, if some people don't want to, they don't want to come better, that's fine, don't need to come back. You become better. You become a better version of yourself. And this is how you change people. You don't change people by going out there and actively changing them. Mm -hmm. Because the minute you change it, they'll turn around and say, stop telling me to give up all my sweets. Look at you. Look, what are you, you eat, how many sugars are you going to put in your coffee? And how many coffee are you going to eat? Then all of a sudden, you helping them turns back into them firing you. And then they say, why is there a project to fix me? Why don't we start a project to fix you? Oh no, this is not the project that I wanted to start on actually. And then, well, the whole thing just falls apart. I say, yeah, okay. You go to your team and mission, I'll stay with my own mission, okay? My mission is me. I am my own mission. You do your other mission. I'm going to take care. So, you know, this, this is how things go wrong. Commitment is always to improve and change ourselves. Yeah? So, in this way, there's a subtle point in there. That really, if at all we come across the path of a realized master, some peace you'll experience, some joy you'll experience. Beyond that, may or may not get anything. No prasad or prasad. No advice, some advice. No help, some help. We don't know. The rest of it is just based on compassion, whether or not it is in your bhagyam to get that. Hmm? In your destiny to also receive that. That's the key. Na eva kurva nakaryan. See, he is not actively doing things, not causing others to do things. Two ways this can be understood. Yeah. One from the standpoint of that person, the individual, the Jivan Mukta. That that Jivan Mukta has got no duties to achieve. Because game is over. Nothing to achieve. Now, when you got nothing to achieve, uh, not actively engaged in anything in particular, it can change. Anything can happen. And then, nakarian, uh, nakarian means not causing others to do. That they can be, let them be. So, as a person transacting no insistence no insistence that they must have a to-do list and they must finish their to-do list and no insistence others must do things yeah now i know i know for grahastas and all that young children and all that this is a thing you, I, I don't say anything no one does anything I know you have to balance these things out, but this is more advanced seekers. These are not seekers with little children and all that. Yeah? So for more advanced seekers, if people become adults. This is even in parenting, you must shift towards this. Yeah? You must shift towards people must figure out what they have to do. You guide them on what they have to do. They have to execute it themselves. You can't force people to become something. Mm -hmm. You guide them and just show them the way. Whether they walk that path, we, we don't know. Yeah. And then as we grow as individuals, this is something important. Eventually, we must let go of to-do lists. Sense of compulsion to get things done. It's a very karma vasana oriented. You know why people do to-do lists and why they enjoy finishing to-do lists? Because we still enjoy happiness dependent on completing actions. We are not enjoying happiness as a state of being. We are still enjoying happiness because of doing, not because of being. That's why to-do list, finish the to-do list. And then, oh, I feel good. Today was a good day. Why was today a good day? Very productive. Got lots of things done. Lots of things done. Huh? That's what people ask me, Swamiji, what do you do with your week? I got nothing. Actually, nothing I did with my week. 
something going on. But I don't know, I can't say that. They think Swami is such a lazy chap sitting in this ashram the whole time. So then you have to make some story up. So, oh yeah, I studied this book and I'm working on this project and doing this text and actually nothing is going on. I'm just sitting there thinking half the time. That's it. I just like thinking. That's it. And out of my thinking, something comes, you talk and it's a class. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm actively working on projects all the time. The Swami is continually working on projects. Ayo, you never want to become a Swami only because it sounds like more project management going on. Huh? Become an enlightened person and just become a big project manager and CEO. Who wants to become that? <laughs> so the concept that I must get this done is a concept we must let go of. As you evolve spiritually, as you evolve spiritually, you move away from that. So you start enjoying the process of doing rather than the result of doing. The process of doing is when you start connecting with a sense of being. You start enjoying the state of being rather than the future state of doing and enjoying result gaining gaining results yeah so it's a mindset that we have to slowly shift that there are so many things that have to be done and unless i get them done not a good day i'm not smashing it out i got to smash it out People say, I got to smash it out. Like smashed avocado, not smash. Smash, everything must be smashed. Don't be smashed. Why do you want to smash your life apart? Just enjoy it. Go through it nicely. And I tell you what, do you like being around people that are constantly trying to get things done the whole series the whole time, browser furrowed the whole time? Do you like being, even your children, are they like this the whole time? If your children are the whole time, and you're, can we play? Is it, no, dad, I have to finger paint. Get out of the way. Come on, finger painting has to be done. And I have to use blue, and I have to use red, and I have to use pink, and I haven't used uh, this. And I go, God, move. It's, just relax only. Now, when we look at children, and they're so focused on their finger painting, we also laugh when we sit there and say, well, the finger painting is not going to mean too much in life, okay? It's nice, but you don't need to take it too seriously. Now, our grandparents, our parents are looking at us, and we are saying, must keep this house clean, and must get this thing done, and must move, and the washing must be done. And they're also looking, going, well, it doesn't mean too much. If the washing is one day late, then the house is not going to fall apart. Yeah? If you eat the same food yesterday, people are not, huh? They are not going to leave you and walk out of the family and abandon you, okay? This doesn't happen. But you see, our current stresses, those that have gone before us, they're laughing. Just as we are laughing at the stresses of those under us. Hmm? Why is everyone so stressed? We're, must do, must do, must do, must do. We have to shift from the must do mentality into a state of being. Where just our state and sense of being, that is where you are reveling. Now, one of the biggest fears that we have about leaving this state of doing and going into a state of being, is that we become lazy. We think, what will I, nothing will get done? Nothing will get done? If I just sit around, nothing will get done. That's why to-do lists are important. And nothing will get done. Now I'll tell you something. Mm -hmm. As you start accessing, focusing, and bring your attention to the present, you will find that a different faculty starts coming out of you, evolving. This is a faculty where head and heart are united. Head and heart are united. This faculty in Shastra is called Hridayam, called Hridayam, the heart. But heart, not in the sense of emotional people. You've got a big heart because it's very affectionate. One like that. That's called Mana. Hridayam is where you have 
a very clear intellect united with a very detached mind. Clear intellect, detached mind. When they come together, it's called Hridayam. And in this space, the heart space, I will use a word, uh, we will use the word intuition. But now again, not the intuition some people understand, gut feeling. Not like a gut feeling, but nothing to do with bacteria in your stomach. Okay, this intuition is to do purely with Clear, discriminative intellect, viveka, plus detached mind, asanga. When these two come together, viveka vairagya, then you get this faculty called hridayam or intuition. This faculty of intuition is very powerful because it helps you to see things clearly each and every moment you have very clear vision what do you mean by clear vision you know what is important you know what is trivial you know when to engage you know when to withdraw Pravritti, nivritti, understood. When to engage, when to withdraw. When to speak, when to remain silent. When to act, when to remain still. This intuitive faculty is what should drive our life. And in order to develop this intuitive faculty, we have to learn to access the present moment. We have to stop living. Some people live in their head. So when they live in their head, they're always planning 20 steps ahead. Yeah. Some people live in their heart emotions. And in their emotions, they're constantly looking for something to do. Someone to meet, someone to have some connection and contact and affection with. They get bored very easily. Yeah. So they don't like present moment because they get bored. So they're looking for some distraction. Other people are planning and working towards some 20 year plan the whole time. So one is head and one is this mind. When these two become united, the person has the clarity of the head, but then does not have that and has the capacity to stay in the moment such as the mind. But they are not bored with the moment, nor are they preoccupied with future. They learn to trust that this intuition will give me the clarity and also the right attitude or energy to execute things as they are needed. This intuition will give me clarity and energy. And energy, also, whatever resources needed, they, they tend to come to you at that time. Those resources can be within you, strength, attitude, devotion, commitment, they come, at that time they manifest or cooperation from others outside that will manifest at that time. This intuitive faculty is when you start going from connecting to yourself to now a connection with the entire universe. There is a connection with the entire universe and through this connection with the universe, you start flowing with the energy of the universe, the needs of the universe, the rhythm of the universe. And you are not stuck in your own little huh, orbit. You are now working huh, in a beautiful harmony and synchronicity with everything else around you. It is an effortless state in which there is no anxiety and there is a 
level of joy and revelry. This state cannot be understood through the intellect. It's beyond the intellect. So this state of Hridaya Kasha, Hridaya Kasha, space of the heart, intuition. I'm struggling in English to give a word, but I'm going to intuition. But this Hridaya, in the space of this Hridaya Kasha, things happen automatically. Things get done. They get done through you, and they get done with the cooperation of the universe. There is no sense of burden. There is no need for meticulous, extensive planning. There is no anxiety. Will others come or will this particular person come? Because even if this particular person doesn't come, the universe will bring someone else to come. That support will come, but it may not come from where I have planned it to come. But it will come. It will come. So when we start developing this, then what happens? Karyam sadnoti sarvada. Things happen. Without you having to force them to happen, without you having to insist that others do it, just does happen. It just does happen. And this is something we have to have faith in because the reason we are worried about giving up our to-do list is because we feel we will fall into a state of anarchy and chaos when nothing gets done. No. We are not talking about going from Rajas to Tamas. That's a Rajasik to a Tamasik movement. We are talking about going from Rajas to Sattva. In Sattva, this Hridaya Akasha comes. And things and ideas, ideas, words, concepts, emotions, they just come to you spontaneously. And you will know what to say, when to say. You will know what to do, when to do. You will know when to act and when to be still. All this will become very spontaneous as you evolve spiritually. And this state of just pure alignment and harmony with the universe, it is something that is so indescribable. It is called Ascharyam. Ascharyam, great wonder. It's a great wonder. Ascharyam nahikim etada pashyatvam budavaibhavam. His whole life is Ascharyam. Whole life is just like that. There's a story about many stories about Gurudev like this. One story I had heard, read, is that Gurudev, now again, this is when he was mainly setting up ashrams. He went to one more remote area. In this remote area, the local villages came to him and they said, Gurudev, Gurudev, no water, no water. People, he looked around and saw. People are struggling, no basic water for people to, you know, cook, clean, wash, all these type of things. So then, you know, the villages of Mahatma was there. Huh? Guru, Guru, please do something for us. Do something for us. Huh? We need water. So it said huh, that he actually <laughs> took his stick and he knocked on one part of the ground. And he said, dig here. He told them, dig here. They dug there and eventually found a well. Underground well of water came. It was there. Actually, what they needed was already there. He just indicated this is where. No, that water came. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know, connected to this project, but then they started, now I want to build. I want to build hospital, dispensary, I want to build all these things. So when he used to go to these villages and all that, then again, local committee will come and say, we need hospital, we need medicines, we need dispensary, we need all these things. So they're going to a sadhu. Sadhu Mahatma got no money himself. <laughs> Usually you go to a rich person, a big danwan. Then you ask to build all these things. Oh, he got money. Sadhu, no money. But they go, go to them. We need hospital dispensary. 
he saw the condition of those people and he told those committee members, build a dispensary, hospital, make sure medicines are given. That committee member in front of everyone, ha, 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 ha. then behind the scenes, you know, he spoke to Gurad privately, said, Gurad, there's no money for these things. Like, where do we get money from? He said, you build, money will come. Yeah? He said, you just build a don't why, money will come. And then, huh? So the committee member was quite anxious now. Well, he's carrying the burden. He feels he's carrying the burden of now having to raise all the money. For this. Oh, he calculated this way. For the immediate start of the project, so much money was required. He said, Guru, we need to start this project. We need this much money right now. Big figure. It was a very big figure. And Guru, they just said, don't worry, it will come. Guru, they have sat for Biksha that evening. And one family came and met him, one lady. As the Dakshana, she wrote one big check. Her Dakshana, one big check she gave to Gurudev. And then Gurudev just hand to that committee member, said, but here. He said, I have raised the first one third of the project. You now get the other two. <laughs> Within that day itself, the funds that were required came. None of it was organized. Just spontaneously it happened. You know, I don't want to unnerve you, but this is how most of Chimay Mission actually operates. <laughs> People are saying, Swamiji, where's the money? Do we have, we don't have the money. That's why Gurudev, you know, our central thing is called CCMT, Central Chimay Mission Trust. Gurudev used to say, CC, empty. CC, there's nothing there only. Have a look, it's empty only. But if the work is good, God will bring that money. That money just comes, the resources come, the support comes, the help comes. Yeah? 70 years we are still going and this organization keeps getting bigger and bigger. But if you really ask how is all this being planned, there is no plan. God is the one operating this whole thing. <laughs> we don't know where this money will come, but it just keeps coming. We don't know where the help comes, it just comes. This is what happens as you move away from the anxious planning of the intellect and the distractions of the mind, and you move into this space of Hridaya Akasha, as you evolve in this intuitive space where there's no extensive to-do lists and burden of getting things done. You start operating in a space of pure being, and in that being, there is joy, there is peace. The whole universe gets attracted to you. And even if you just hint at one thing, actually before you even hint at it, someone's already said, so how many want to get you this? So I so want to get you that. The universe just brings it to you. And things happen. Things are happening. It's not like you're sitting there, nothing is going on. Things are happening, but you are not the one doing them. It is just happening through you. Universal mind takes over and it just operates through you. May thy grace and blessings flow through us to the world around us. That's what that means. We chant that as our pledge. May thy grace and blessings flow through us to the world around us. It is God's grace that is taking care of everything. We just had to become instrumental. That's what it's showing you. Yeah? So, these are all subtle points about the stage of enlightenment. So in the stage of enlightenment, we have seen, main thing as a seeker, it is anand. Complete Paramananda. It is also Nirbhayam, complete state of fearlessness. No anxiety, no fear. Yeah? Through your spontaneous radiating of Ananda, other people become inherently happy. Because you have Ananda, you have no insistence on making other people become someone or do something for you. So you have no demand with no demands and spontaneously radiating happiness, 
Sarvananda Karaha. Because your mind is dynamically operating in the present moment without intellectual planning extensively, without anxious, distracted emotions in the present, that person operates in a space of Hridaya Akasha, highly intuitive faculty, where they become connected to the total mind. Through this connection with the total mind, the total mind operates through you. Things happen, and it is a great wonder. This is the existence and culmination. This is the culmination of our existence, called Jivan Mukti. Okay? And each and every one can attain this. This is not some state of existence only meant for the elite few. Each and every person can attain this state. Hmm? It is available to all. Okay, so with that, we have now finished the chapter on Jivan Mukti. Now, three verses to go on Kutagmita. And the text is complete. We will see them next week. Okay. I give you an exercise, one exercise. Uh, we, we, if you're living with people, yeah, try to write down the things that you feel you have to do, but others feel you don't need to do. Yeah, things that you think you have to. There are some things that you think you'll have to do. Others will say, yes, you should be doing it. Good. That's fine. That's called duty, maybe. But there are some things which we personally overlook. Things that we personally insist upon. Others say it's not necessary. These are personal ragas, attachments. Yeah? Spending 45 minutes doing your hair every day. Think, think, think what that is. Others say unnecessary, but you think compulsory. <laughs> Write that down and these things, see if you can let go of. See if you can let go. Because if others that you're living with, especially spouse is the main. It's about saying it doesn't need to be done. But they're also working with you in your journey, looking after your things. And if they are saying it doesn't need to be done, just start becoming aware of these things. Because these are added things we put on our to-do list which don't need to be there. They may not need to be there. We are putting them down because we are personally insistent upon them. Okay? Try that. Let's just see how that goes. I hope you turn up next week. Maybe this class is on one of those lists. I, anyway, let's see. I may have given the wrong sadhana. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamadachate Purnasi Purnamadaya Purname Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Gurbhyo Namaha Hari Om